Welcome to Advancing the Management of Patients with Metastatic Melanoma, presented by Albert Einstein College of Medicine at Yeshiva University at OMED Live. You are tuned into today's first session, titled The Evolving Role of Immunotherapy in Patients with Advanced Melanoma. My name is Patrick Hu, and I'm Professor and Chairman of the Melanoma Medical Oncology Department at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'm pleased to serve as chair for this important educational program. Today's session is a live interactive program that allows us to take questions in real time throughout the presentation. I encourage you to send us your questions anytime by typing them in the box located in the lower left hand side of your screen. I'd now like to introduce our first faculty member, Dr. Satna Patel, Assistant Professor in the Department of Melanoma Medical Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Satna, thanks, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Dr. Hu. I'm pleased to join you for this discussion of immunotherapy and how we use it to treat our patients with melanoma. This presentation will include a discussion of off-label or investigational use of products, and we'll discuss them by referring to them as clinical trials or studies or protocols. We'll start briefly with an introduction to the immune system and jump right into the first immunotherapy approved for melanoma, the cytokine interleukin-2. We'll then move on to the utility of cancer vaccines, checkpoint blockade inhibitors, and then Dr. Hu will wrap us up with the discussion of T-cell therapy. So melanoma is the most aggressive skin cancer, and it's estimated to take 10,000 American lives this year. Case reports have demonstrated that melanoma can metastasize anywhere throughout the body. It's the third most common cause of brain metastasis after lung cancer and breast cancer. It's commonly found in the lungs and liver and can also metastasize to distant skin regions. But likewise, the immune system is pervasive throughout the body as well, and this sets up nicely for using immunotherapy against melanoma. The hardest working cell of the, of the cancer fighting immune system may just be the T cell and the natural killer cells. T cells are stimulated by antigen presentation uh, when bound to a molecule known as the MHC molecule. This leads to profound stimulation of T cells in addition to using endogenous interleukin-2 as a cytokine to enhance the, the proliferation. So this led to the early development of interleukin-2 as a therapy for melanoma. And what we learned from this cytokine therapy is that there is a fraction of patients who can derive long-term durable disease control. These are patients on the right hand, hand of the screen that we often describe as being on the tail of the curve. When we stratify high-dose IL-2 by types of response, it's those patients with a complete response to therapy that make up the highest proportion of patients on the tail of the curve. Patients with a complete response are those who have radiographic and clinical disappearance of all visible melanoma lesions. Partial responders make up the next highest fraction of patients on the tail of the curve. And this year at the ASCO annual meeting, we found out that even patients whose best response is stable disease to high-dose interleukin-2 derive benefit over patients whose best response is disease progression. So this tells us that there are patients who can have long-term disease control. And the data has shown that patients who maintain a complete response at 30 months are often long-term survivors of their melanoma. There are very few relapses beyond that point. But interleukin-2 does have some challenges, mainly in its administration. It's a very specialized treatment that requires often ICU level care, and you're in the hospital for a week at a time, managing not only the acute toxicities, but the residual weight gain in those issues. However, this drug has, was FDA approved on the basis of composite phase two studies that demonstrated an overall survival and improvement in re uh, response in a small subset of patients. Generally speaking, we say that high-dose interleukin-2 has the opportunity to offer a 15% response rate and a complete response rate in melanoma patients of about 6%. So the goal for treating patients with high-dose IL-2 is to enhance the response and identify biomarkers that will predict who's going to respond and who won't. So patients who have st stimulation of a certain percentage of regulatory T cells after their first cycle of high-dose interleukin-2 may demonstrate lack of response to this therapy. 
In the peripheral blood of patients, when the regulatory T cells are stimulated, those that are ICOS positive or inducible co-stimulatory positive, those higher fold increase of T regulatory cells tend to predict patients who will lack a response to interleukin-2 therapy. These kinds of biomarker studies are very important. In addition, we need to figure out how to enhance the response of high-dose IL-2. We certainly want to improve more patients' outcomes than just 6% and 15% in the short term. And so in that vein, the surgery branch at the National Cancer Institute looked at combining interleukin-2 with another immunotherapy, ipilimumab. And in the red curve here, what you can see is they looked at the response rate of patients who received essentially concomitant ipilimumab and interleukin-2 therapy and found a complete response rate of 17%. So nearly three times high-dose interleukin-2 response alone. On the basis of this, there's currently an ongoing clinical trial in the nation looking at the sequence of ipilimumab and high-dose IL-2 and vice versa in an attempt to enhance the response rate. Now we'll move on to talk about cancer vaccines. So cancer vaccines often work by presenting a particle or an antigen to the immune system that will then stimulate proliferation of T cells. In melanoma, there are some common antigens that are often made into peptide vaccines. And in fact, a large randomized phase three study looked at the combination of Hydos and interleukin-2 with a GP100 peptide vaccine. 185 patients were randomly assigned treatment, and the primary endpoint was clinical response. Indeed, the addition of vaccine did improve clinical response to therapy over high-dose interleukin-2 alone. And when you look at progression-free survival, patients who received interleukin-2 with the vaccine had an improvement in their progression-free survival over interleukin-2 alone. Overall survival was significant up until about four years of follow-up, at which point statistical significance was lost. However, you can see by the p-value, it just barely lost its statistical significance, and these curves remain separated for the early part of the treatment, treatment years. In addition, vaccines are um, being utilized to induce even more potent immune responses. And what's been shown with vaccine therapy in cancer is when you do an injection of vaccines, you often get a very robust local T cell response. But what we'd like to see is a systemic response as well. We'd like to see the T cells infiltrating at distant sites, not just at the vaccine site. And one of the ways to augment vaccine responses is to use certain vaccine adjuvants, such as toll-like receptor agonists. Toll-like receptors directly stimulate antigen-presenting cells, and there's a, a medicinal agent called reziquimod, a toll-like receptor 7 and 8 agonist, that can be used in conjunction with vaccine therapy to boost an immune response. So what you're seeing here is a clinical trial patient who received a peptide vaccine, and then he received reziquimod topical gel over the injection site, which was not the lesion site that you see here, it was a distant site. So he received an injection site and then topical reziquimod, and you started to see immune responses at the tumor site. So you started to see distant immune responses. And so we're currently investigating the use of polypeptide melanoma vaccines with these toll-like receptor adjuvants to see if we can enhance immune responses locally but also distantly. So that tries to uh, make the vaccine look more like an infection site because, in fact, our immune system is really uh, geared towards uh, fighting infection, right? Correct. So we're trying to make that vaccine site look like uh, an infection by adding substances that are now being defined like toll-like receptor agonists. Right. So moving on to checkpoint inhibitors, this has really put melanoma on the map in recent years. So. As we just discussed, T cells and antigen presenting cells often interact in a very delicate balance. Antigen presenting cells need to present a tumor antigen in the context of an MHC molecule. That MHC molecule and that peptide presentation is recognized by a T cell receptor. However, that interaction alone is insufficient to stimulate a T cell. And what is needed is co stimulatory molecules. So on the antigen presenting cell, a, mo a receptor, a molecule known as B7 binds to CD28 on the T cell. And this co-stimulation then leads to activation of the immune system in the T cells. However, the body has its natural checks and balances and would not let this go unopposed. And so just as the immune system is being...